Welcome to Corporal's Corner. Today we're in San Saba, Texas, hosting a Pathfinder basic class. So stick around. Like I mentioned before, we're in San Saba, Texas, and we're attending a Pathfinder basic class hosted by Badger Claw Leatherworks. What I'm gonna do is we're gonna go up here, we're gonna see what's happening, I'm gonna give you the highlights of that class. Let's go check it out. So I think that we need to take a second look at history a little bit and understand what was really going on. And that's kind of what I did when I developed this five and 10 C mentality. So for us, when I look at this five C's, and we won't talk about the 10 C's too much right off the bat, we'll talk about the first five. If you look at these first five C's, you've got a cutting tool. So we're talking about, when I say the five C's, a lot of people have misconceptually thought over time that Dave said you're only supposed to carry five things into the woods. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying there's five categories of items that you should base your kit around, and two is one and one is none. You should always have multiples of everything. From looking at journals and diaries and evi archaeological evidence to discover what they thought was important to them. And what I found when I started listing all of these things down is that they all really fell into about five categories. And those five categories were cutting tools, combustion devices, cover elements, containers, and cordage. Those were the five things that people carried all the way back to the days of Utsu the Iceman. He carried those five C's. He had a copper axe, he had a flint knife. I can guarantee if you would give him a buck 110, he'd have took it in a heartbeat. But he had flint because that's what they had. He had a copper axe because that's what they had. He had containers that were made from birch that were sealed in birch tar. They weren't the containers like we have today. But if you'd offered Daniel Boone a stainless steel water bottle, he'd have said, I'll take two, one for me and one for Thermal regulating device to spread that thing out in front of the heat of a fire and take advantage of conductive heat from that shortwave radiation to warm his body. He could have put that thing in front of a rock overhang over a couple sticks to block the wind from coming in with the fire on one side. So he had things that he could inventively use as a cover element, like we would carry a tarp or a blanket now. He had those things along with the clothing on his back made of skins and furs, okay? The cordage elements that he had were very rudimentary. He had different types of plant cordage. He had different types of animal sinew and rawhide cordage that were found in different pieces of his kit, as well as on a stone disc that they assume was attached to a belt, but they really don't know what that stone disc was for. I suspect it was probably a counterweight for a drill, but nobody really knows what it was for. The quest for punk wood. The struggle is real. Wanting this really finer stuff that's fungy because it'll take the spark a lot easier. Whoa. Look at this guy. Ladies and gentlemen, the bearded Burton. Welcome to Texas, Sean. Drinks <laughs> down. Tonight, put more in there and make more and just fill that thing up. And then you can slowly pull some of that, get it lit with your ferro rod, and that's gonna help with that dry grass or that wet grass. So it's not gonna matter if I stick it in my pocket and sweat on it. We're just gonna sell it. Yeah, you're gonna be putting it. I mean, this is all gold right here. Here's some more if anybody needs it. This looks like it was struck by lightning, how it was burnt from the inside out. The first thing I do when I come to rocks is I look for texture and Here's two good candidates. This is really porous and grainy. This is a sandstone probably. So if I hit this with a piece of quartz or something, when this breaks, it's gonna be really brittle. This is not hard enough to throw sparks off of a steel. Something that's smooth, that has a tight grain like this, this is what I'm looking for. Um, this actually has been tumbled by the river 
and it's had pieces broken off of it. So you're always looking for stuff that's less than 90 degrees. So if you hold this up and this is your flat line, that's less than 90 degrees. All right, so that's a shelf. So this has been really weather damaged. You see all these cracks and stuff. But technically, if this was a nice piece of rock, I could hold this at a downward angle and hit on this, on this shelf, that's what that's called. And not only the force of me hitting it, but also the actual sound wave travels and causes this to fracture. Guys that are really good at this can use their fingers and they'll pull off and send that fracture further back or they'll stop it to shape this rock. But just to, this one's gonna go everywhere, but it will break. Um, just to show you, I'll just hit this here on my palm. So it's gonna stop where my hand is. So here's what we have in this. This does have traces of chert in it. See how tight grained and pretty that is? But it's a mixed rock because there's quartzite in that. And that's what gives it that little grainy, bites your fingernail kind of stuff. So this is hard enough, but you won't ever get a good flake off of this. There's some pieces that I found down here. I set myself up for it. For it. But, here we go. So see, here's one that somebody can use. It's got an edge on that. <laughs> that might have been somebody. Here. That's good. While the students are out here, they're thinking about their next fire. We came across some punk wood, we collected it. Now they're filling a bag full of sticks called smalls. They're looking for tinder, fuel, and kindling for the next fire. It's a possum mentality, taking advantage of those resources as they present themselves. See all this right here? Yeah. Grab it and you hear that snap? It's dry. All this right through here. All the low hanging fruit. <laughs> There you go. Beautiful. Yeah. Wow. Perfect. Put it out. Or, yeah, you can put it out or you can save it or you can throw it out. It doesn't matter. Good job. Thank you. <laughs> you have to dry out enough material to last you tomorrow through several bird nests. Get this grass dried out tonight. And keep it dry because tomorrow's going to be pouring down rain. So dry some grass and stuff out and keep it dry. Where's the end? Trying to stink wood, Barry. Stinky Barry wood.
drying the tinder out. <laughs> got a piece of grass in there for you know, you know that. So you guys, you guys got your water boiled, eh? Good job, man. Good job. This is tough weather, man. If you got water to boil in this weather, you need something. You want that that front front area to be where the wind's coming from, and you don't want to block that area off. If you put a bunch of sticks right here, you're going to block the oxygen flow. When you to make a fire work properly, you want to take advantage of what's called the Venturi effect, which in common terms is called draft. If you hear a fire burning and it's making a lot of noise, like it's drafting, okay? It's sucking air from the bottom and pushing it up. That's the Venturi effect. That's what you want to get if you want a good fire. To get that, you need an opening in the front here that oxygen can get into from the bottom. If you block that with sticks, you're not going to get that. So now you take your tinder bundle, pretty dry. And you want to get that thing down to as fine as you can get it with as much surface area as you can get to catch those sparks. And really, if you've got a good fire lay, you shouldn't have to play with it too much. Once you get it set, you should almost be able to light it and walk away from it if you've got a good fire light. But if you've got marginal material, that changes things too. And you guys have a lot of marginal material here. This is not optimal by any means. All right. Give yourself plenty of airspace in there and just kind of tuck him up in there. Just like that. Then get your sticks out. You got some sticks, brother? Holy cow. Uh-oh. I can't even. But it is what it is. As long as your flames are above the current level of your fuel, keep on rocking. And then stop and let it catch up, and then put more on there. But always build from the outside up. Yeah, that thing is going to go now. All right. <coughs> I can hear that water from here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Here? Yeah. yeah, is that what that is? What's the sound of the water boiling? In you only have to do this for every two guys. So you guys only need up? one fire. Two bottles. What are we waiting Do you want us to pack up to go collect it? Like I said yesterday, really the only reason we're carrying this compass is so that we can walk a straight line. Naturally, everyone experiences what's called lateral drift, and it'll either usually be to the left or to the right, and there's a lot of factors that can affect lateral drift. Everyone has lateral drift of some sort. It can be because one of your legs is longer than the other. Some people say it's because you're either right brain or left brain. It could be because your pack's heavier on one side than the other. It can be because you're wincing from the sun as you're walking. It can be because you're walking side hill. Lots of things can cause lateral drift, but what you want to find out is what your natural lateral drift is. And the reason you want to eliminate that lateral drift is that's what makes people walk in circles. You always hear about people walking in a circle when they get lost. It's because they've walked far enough and experienced enough lateral drift that it brought them completely around in a circle. And that's what causes, that's what lateral drift will cause. So you want to eliminate that so that you can walk a straight line. And because human beings have binocular vision, as long as you can see an object, you can walk straight to that object. But if you look at an object and you start walking toward it and you lose sight of that object because you go down inside of a holler or something like that, when you come up the other side, you'll no longer be walking toward that object because your lateral drift is going to take you left or right of that object. The further away the object is you're walking to, the worse you're going to be off at lateral drift. You know? The closer you get this to your body, the bigger that V becomes. The bigger that V becomes, the more margin for error you have. The further you get it away, the smaller that V becomes and the less margin of error you're gonna have. With the mirror on this compass, instead of having that magnifying glass, you can tilt this mirror to see your bezel ring and you don't have to have the magnifying glass to see it as long as you have decent vision. All right. And you have a movable bezel ring, and underneath that bezel ring, you have an outline of a needle and a couple cross hatches that are magnified or that are uh, glow in the dark, and that's called your doghouse. So what happens is you point that compass at what you're trying to go to, and you tilt your mirror and you move that bezel ring until your north needle is inside that doghouse. And at that point, 
as long as you don't move left or right, you're walking a straight line. If you move left or right, the needle's going to leave the doghouse, and you're no longer walking that straight line. And that's what's going to happen out here on this nav torch that we got. You're going to be given a bearing number. You'll plug it into your compass. You'll either send your leapfrogger out or find something that's in that line of sight. And you'll walk to that until you find the bearing. Until you find the tag in the tree. And it'll be a yellow you know, piece, of, be a piece of orange marking tape. And on that marking tape will be the next bearing written in marker. Okay. You'll plug that bearing in and you'll move until you get on that bearing line. And you'll go to your next one. Okay? What we're going to tell you is, we're going to tell you what the pace count is between these bearings so that you know you didn't overshoot it. That's the importance of pace counting. If I tell you, take a 240 degree bearing and I tell you, travel 5K and you have no way of tracking how far you've walked, you don't know if you're there yet or whether you've walked past it a whole kilometer. If you know how far it's supposed to be, you'll know whether you passed it or not, or at least close. Everybody's pace count is going to be a little different. All these pace counts are figured on an average between Sean's pace count, my pace count, and Jonathan's pace count. We just took an average and figured the pace count of all these points. So it'll be close for you. But you'll want to figure out what your pace count is. Yours might be like 61 because you're tall. Yours might be 66. So what you'll want to do as partners is you'll want one guy doing the pace counting all the time so you don't mess that up. So you're not using his pace count once and your pace count once. That are you know five or six off of each other. Okay, so you want to keep be cognizant of that, but you want to kind of trade duties on the compass so you both get used to doing it. Okay. So what we need to figure out is first of all we need to figure out our pace count. You want to do your pace count with all of your equipment on and everything that you're going to normally be carrying. If you are doing this for real, and not that this isn't what you're doing for real, but if you're doing this if you, for your own knowledge what you want to do is you want to do a pace count for yourself wherever you are and you want to do it uphill downhill side hill rough terrain flat terrain because they're all going to be different and then average them out okay right now the students are coming back from getting their pace count once they establish that pace count, we're going to head over to the land nav course, and they're going to love it. You know why? Because I built it. method of navigation called PAL, which stands for Positive Asthma Uniform Layout, is what that stands for. You can walk into an area that you've never been into before and never get lost, even if you don't have a map. That's the importance of it. If you don't have a map, you can make your own map, and you can get back to where you started from without having to backtrack your way back. In other words, you don't have to take a reverse asthma from every place you've been. You can figure out, this is where I stopped, now I want to go back to my truck. And you can figure the straight line distance, azimuth, and direction by using the pole method. Okay, so another piece of gear, so two, two, two. Well, we'll have to pull out here. Whisper it, though. The answer was 33 degrees. You guys are only three degrees off. Okay? So that's really good. You did a good job. Do a good job. You're on it. Good job. San Saba, Texas. Just the highlights. Just like I promised.
Once again, thank you for your comments, views, and support. Thanks for watching. Get out in the field, have some fun. I'm going to catch you next time.